Yeah, I was in an event called uh, 100 Million Mastermind and another event that merged with it called Avengers. And most of the guys there were there uh, in real estate. Uh, I mean, some of the guys were like 20 years old, 21 years old, already flipping houses. And one guy is 24 years old who said he was flipping luxury houses. And uh, another guy has like $40 million worth of um, multi-family housing. And and so when it was uh, my turn to talk, I got up there and told him, I said, look, you spent three days talking about how to uh, own real estate. And I want to talk to you about how to own the real estate in your head. Because what you just find in these kinds of environments are these incredibly like driven type A guys and, and uh, some women, it's, but it's, I would say it's 90%, 95% male dominant. But the women who are there, they're also type A, really driven, really um, uh, aggressive. They have big dreams, big aspirations, a lot of ambition. And, and it seems that a part of what comes with that is the volatility of having um, a lot of relationship issues, a lot of, a lot of relational crises. And in fact, I was talking to the, the one guy that was closer to my age who he was on the other end of um, incredible success. And, and I said, hey, look, the first group that already has made their hundreds of millions um, is different than the second group that's aspiring to make their hundreds of millions. This group, I want to tell them to not set the world on fire because one day they're going to have to come back and they're going to realize they left nothing behind for them to enjoy. And the other group, they've already set the world on fire and their life on fire. And now they're trying to figure out how to rebuild their life and their world. And one of the things that, you know, I just thought was really important talking about is that the more of the real estate around you, you try to attain, the more you try to make your outside world bigger, the more you need to make sure that you make your inside world bigger. Because if your outside world is bigger than your inside world, eventually those worlds are going to collide and your inner world is going to consume your external world. And so if you do not spend as much time and energy and focus and give as much attention to your inner world, it will become a black hole. Then no matter how successful you are, no matter how much money you make, uh, no matter how famous you are, no matter um, how much you uh, accumulate, eventually it's all going to be consumed by that black hole that um, is your soul. And so it's always an interesting thing to um, be the speaker that talks about making who you are, your preeminent goal in your life, the person you're becoming, uh, because it's almost like you're just putting fuel in that rocket ship. Every single session is, you know, how to scale, how to multiply, how, how to leverage, how to build, and uh, how to accumulate, um, how to overcome problems that will remove your, your financial ceiling. And then I get up there and it just feels like the brakes are coming on really hard. You can smell the smoke of the rubber and the screeching of the wheels. And it, 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 it feels like I am running in the middle of a racetrack at an F1 race. And I'm holding the flag up going, stop, not slow down, but stop and make sure you're going in the right direction and make sure that you're not destroying everything in the process. Aaron, you know a lot more about F1 than I do, but um, I think it seems like a part of the strategy of F1 is choosing the right tires. And if you choose the wrong tires, your tires can burn too fast or, or not let you move fast enough. And, and a part of the strategy is knowing how to pit to change the tires out. And so even the fastest drivers in the world understand that one, if you're burning too much rubber, you may feel like you're going faster, but you're going to lose the race. And if you don't know when to pull into the pit and slow down and get new tires, you're going to lose the race. I think a lot of type A personalities, they think pulling into the pits is a sign of weakness. Pulling in to get new tires, that's, that's stupid. That's a sign of weakness. You're losing time. You're losing ground. You're, you, know, you were in first and now you're in whatever 12th you know, place. And wisdom teaches you the guy who doesn't take care of the tires is going to run on his rims, is going to come in last or not even finish the race. The guy that doesn't take the time and discipline himself to get into the pit at the right moment to, to 
refuel and to regain what they need to get back out into the race, that's the person that crashes and burns. And it's so important. Uh, and one of, one of the reasons I love being in these environments, one of the reasons I love investing in these kinds of entrepreneurs is that their influence will be so disproportionate because of the way they're designed, because of the way they attack life. And they do, they attack life. And if I can help them build a powerful inner world, if I can help them redesign their internal structures and um, in a sense, as like a mind architect to help them have mental structures for sustainable success, it'll change everything, which is true for all of us. It doesn't matter whether you're, um, you know, an F1 racer or um, an entrepreneur, whether you're in real estate or in banking or whether you're a teacher or a plumber or a barista or an actor, uh, all of us have to deal with the tension of what the external world, the world around us is demanding of us and what our internal world is demanding of us. The problem is that the person that's easiest to ignore is yourself. All the demands of everyone else will pull you. And when your soul is crying out saying, uh, you need to tend to the health of yourself, you tend to the health of your soul. You need to make sure that you're emotionally, mentally, spiritually, relationally healthy. You need to slow down or pull into the pit and realize you're not going to make it if you don't take care of these things. That's the easiest voice to ignore. And that's the one that will, in the end, um, cause it all to collapse. I want to help people have sustainable success, not just momentary success. You can have a brand new Ferrari, but if you have the wrong tires, you might as well be driving a Williams. 1975 Pinto. <laughs> a Williams racing car. Because <laughs> you're not going to make it. And I think that's true in terms of, um, of relationships. That uh, you may be a Ferrari. You may have all the intelligence and passion and talent and capacity, the potential to achieve extraordinary things. But the tires are really, let's just make it literal, the four people that are most important in your life. And one of those tires is definitely the person you marry. And because that person will have more influence over your life than any other decision you make. Uh, but, but there are also other significant people. And, and so when you look at the, the top, you know, three, four, five people in your life, they're in the sense of the tires, they, they become the functional measure of how far and how fast um, you can go and how much you can achieve. And I think that's, that's like a, a really a perfect metaphor. But I also thought about the fact that I guess for myself, for me, the unique thing is like, I, I think I'm both an F1 driver and a pit stop <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> because I'm an F1 driver for me. I do attack life and I like challenges. and I love the tension of failure and success. And I love creating new things. I just, I love the whole entrepreneurial journey, which is maybe why I, have such a love and affection for entrepreneurs. And I told someone yesterday, you have the great curse of having a skill people want to pay for. <laughs> we uh, talk about that. Yeah, uh, you know, I, I, I said, you're just really talented. So someone's gonna pay you a lot of money to work for them. And so the risk of starting your own company, the risk of owning what you create will seem so high because Someone will pay you a lot of money to work for them, to help them fulfill their dreams and achieve their goals. And, and that's not a bad thing. Hey, if that's, is that, if that's where you find your fulfillment, you need to figure out what really brings you satisfaction and fulfillment in life. And if it is working for someone, I hope there are people who work for me that find incredible fulfillment in their life. And this is exactly the right thing for them. So I don't want to diminish that. I need people who go, wow, this is exactly where I belong. This is the team I want to join. Not everyone's supposed to be the creator of that space. It takes a unique set of skills and gifts and, and, um, and, and almost like a, a ruthless uh, attack of, on failure and success. And, but what I do think is that if a person has the capacity to create 
an environment where they are the owners, that's the best possible choice. Because I think the most dangerous job in the world is when you're completely dependent on someone else's paycheck. Because what if their company fails? You, you've lost your job and you won't even know until the last minute. And, you know, what, what if they decide they want to get someone else? And so it, you're always, you need to realize you're always at risk. And so you have to decide which risk you're more comfortable with. And I just always chose to take the risk of betting on myself and creating um, my own vehicles for income. But some of it, I don't want to sound so noble, I couldn't get a job. <laughs> you know, right. I just don't think I'm that hireable. And uh, I didn't have that concrete skill where somebody would say, I got to have you. In right. fact, I remember one time I did a, a film project, I produced and directed it, designed the thing. You, you were on my team. You were my second director and uh, action director. And, uh, um, and they paid us to create this film, and it was extraordinary. And then he decided to do another film, and instead of hiring me, he went up hiring my staff to save the money of hiring me and to do it himself, bought all the equipment that I used. And then it was a disaster, it was horrible. And they were calling me on the set because they were saying, just do what you did when you worked for Irwin. And they were all saying, we worked for Irwin and he told us what to do. <laughs> he was the one that knew how to design this. And then the guy in charge called me and asked if I would come and fix their film. I almost did it. And uh, my brother actually talked me out of it. He said, don't go fix somebody else's mess. And, uh, and I asked the owner, I said, why didn't you just hire me the second time? He goes, because I couldn't figure out what you did. So I thought I can cut out the expense of Irwin and do this myself. And that was, I think, my dilemma in life is people couldn't figure out what I did, why I was needed. And I would always say to people, look, I know it's hard to explain what I do, but if you take me out of the room, the room changes. And if you put me in the room, the room gets really good. And so I have this ethereal talent that's a little hard to measure. And I had to find a way to value what I did. Um, I think maybe if someone had seen me early on in my life and said, wow, you have talent, I'll hire you. Maybe I would have never become an entrepreneur. But I thought I have two choices, minimum wage or an entrepreneur. And I decided to be an entrepreneur. <laughs> Yeah, that intangible that I'm describing is, I think it's almost seen most clearly in an orchestra conductor. Because the conductor is the only person not playing an instrument. And yet that conductor is the person who's completely responsible for the sound of the entire orchestra. And so that conductor, you might look at that person and go, well, he's just waving this stick. And I actually... Um, worked at being a conductor when I was younger. And, uh, and, I, and it's so much harder than people think. What they don't realize is the conductor has to have the best ear. The conductor is the only person in the entire orchestra that has to care about what every single person is doing. Wait, the irony of this, this metaphor, metaphor is that the same guy who's, who we, we shot, shot the, the film for, the, shot the documentary for that yes. team then he hired the other guy. The other guy was just a cinematographer. Yeah. He's like, you hired me to shoot it, not to be Irwin. You should have hired Irwin to be Irwin. Me, I'm who I am. He is the one that told him that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You want that, go get Irwin. But when we, we, they came back to us and we charged them so much more. And then we went and shot a conductor <laughs> as the primary like subject, as yes. part of the documentary. Do you remember that? Yes. One of my favorite scenes in any documentary I've ever shot was when we shot the, the conductor and we cut between the conductor and the graffiti artist and went back and forth between this orchestration and, um, and this uh, graffiti artist painting. And it was just this beautiful, um, it was like a ballet between them. And um, yeah, and those, that's the intangible. It's being able to see things in the invisible that you're able to translate into the visible. And, and so when I, when you, Talk about that intangible thing. A, a person who doesn't understand how extraordinary things are created, they think that the conductor is um, secondary, that they're replaceable. 
But what we do know is that the best conductors in the world conducting the same piece, that piece will come out completely different. Because conducting is not just the outcome of their talent, it's an outcome of their essence. Mood, the, the mood and the texture, it, it, it permeates the very essence and personality and character of the conductor. And it's, I think it's true in everything in life, just like leadership. I mean, leadership is conducting. And I think one of the things that um, I really have such a high value for, and you can see this with great basketball coaches too. I mean, why is it that one basketball coach can have the same amount of talent and not excel, but another basketball coach can? And it's because they're able to identify the unique talents and skills and contribution of each player and put them together where the collective whole is greater than the parts. I don't think another coach other than Phil Jackson would have been able to orchestrate what was created with Michael Jordan and Scottie Pippen and the Chicago Bulls. I don't think that the Warriors would exist without the personality and genius of a Steve Kerr. I think the talent of Steph Curry would have been wasted. The talent of, of Clay Thompson would have been wasted if they didn't have the right kind of coach creating that invisible chemistry that makes a dynasty. They wouldn't have known what to do with Draymond Green. They would have traded him. You know, and, and I think it's, it's really true when you look at history, when you see Phil Jackson bringing Dennis Rodman to the uh, second part of the three-peat going, no one could even work with Dennis Rodman. And I mean, here, here's a guy who married himself in the middle of the championship run. I mean, he's pretty eccentric. And, and yet Phil Jackson knew how to bring this team together in the most extraordinary way. Great leaders make everyone better, not just themselves. And I think, and I, I think that, yeah, I, I'm going to say that's my contribution. I make people better. I make people who are bad average. I make average people good and I make good people great. And I think I make great people extraordinary and even elevate their genius. And so recently somebody asked me, so what do you do in your one-on-one -on -one coaching? And I told him, I said, I coach geniuses. That's actually my forte. That's my genius. I can help people who are the best at something, um, elevate and pull out the very, very best of themselves. They didn't even know it was still there.